Um, I'll hand it over to Carly. This is our second, um, well, not second or first, but uh, Carson presented last week. And this is Carly Malali uh, sharing her art history with all of you. So thank you for coming. Hi, everyone. Uh, so yeah, my name's uh, Carly Mullally. I'm a textile artist. Uh, I'm normally working out of Chipotle, Halifax. Um, I'm very, very lucky to be working out of Manasquig or Chester on the South Shore. And I am very much connected to being from the Maritimes and being you know, near the coast. So I'll talk a little bit about that during my practice. And if at any point you're noticing that your like screen is lagging, you can feel free to turn off your camera. I won't be offended. I know that can happen sometimes. Uh, but I do, I have like a few little clips. You don't need sound or anything, but if they start to lag, just note that um, they're just process videos. So it'll, it's okay if you don't, if you miss a few clips here and there. Um, and you can feel free to ask questions in the chat or if you want to interject. Um, hopefully I don't run over and we can have some time at the end. I tend to ramble sometimes, so we'll just be prepared <laughs> for when that happens. So I thought I'd start off just by talking about what brought me to where I am today in my practice. I was always a creative kid. I was always a creative person. Uh, and I've been very, very fortunate to have a family who always supported my creative endeavors. Uh, this is a painting of a crab I did when I was eight years old. And so I've had this strange fascination with crustaceans and the coast and maritime life uh, since I was very young. And um, I also wanted to talk about my parents uh, who are in this chat with my dog Finnegan right now. Uh, my mom is from Northern New Brunswick, uh, the Camelton area. And then my dad is from Eastern PEI, Surrey. And then I was born and raised in New Glasgow, Nova Scotia. So I got to spend time in all three maritime provinces uh, along the Restigouche River in New Brunswick. Uh, the Northumberland Strait. There's a lot of beautiful beaches throughout PEI and Pictou County. And it, it really informs uh, my practice, my material choices as well. Uh, my dad is a woodcarver and he was always very supportive from the beginning. Uh, taught me a bit about woodcarving when I was younger. And he's actually wearing, in this photo, he's wearing an apron I made for him when I was in second year of university. But people say I get a lot of my creativity from him and also that I look just like him. But then if you know my mother, you would probably say I look just like my mom. And although she would probably deny it, she's also very creative. She made me this needle book uh, several years ago and it's one of my prized possessions. I use it all the time. And she, so she's a really talented uh, cross-stitcher and has also been supportive right from day one. But that these two women have probably really formed what my interests are the most. On the left is my grandmother, a very tiny French Canadian woman on the left. And she is a really, really talented knitter. And I have some of her work that I'll show later on in this presentation. But she knew from a young age that I was interested in textiles. I was interested in fibers and uh, she tried to teach me how to knit. I was very impatient as a kid. I wanted things to be done now. And she realized maybe knitting wasn't for me, but she took me to Walmart when I was eight years old, bought me a $50 sewing machine and signed me up for sewing lessons with the woman on the right. Uh, her name's Marilyn Taylor. She's a very, very uh, talented and accomplished quilter from Stellarton in Pictou County. And she wasn't necessarily a sewing teacher. She didn't teach other kids. Uh, she was a retired school teacher or she is a retired school teacher, uh, but my grandmother, you know, begged her if she would give me lessons. So from the time I was eight years old, every Friday after school, I would go to Maryland's to sew up until I uh, made my prom dress for graduation in grade 12. So she was definitely probably my biggest supporter when it came to fashion and textiles and my interests. 
Um, I was also a 4-H kid, which I always love to tell people, a 2006 junior poultry, chip, or poultry showmanship champion. I also made this dress on the right in 4-H. And I think having kids being involved in these organizations like 4-H, Scouts, Cadets, where you're, where you're doing something um, practical in a group setting, you gain confidence. And it, it really, really helped uh, ground me, I think, as well. So... This is also a wood carving I did with my father uh, for a 4-H competition as well. So naturally being the creative kid, I decided to go to art school and I got accepted to NASCAD when I was, or in 2011 and the huge game changer. It, re it really helped me look at art in a different way from a critical perspective, from uh, you know learning different disciplines. I knew when I went in, I decided I want to do fashion because I thought I sew, I work with fabrics, that means I have to be a fashion designer. So I started off taking all of the fashion and textiles classes. Uh, I did this piece in um, second year uh, after I did foundation and it's made out of bread tabs that I taped and used rubber bands to uh, fasten it together. Uh, I use quite a bit of found material in my work, uh, especially recently. So you'll see that uh, through my progression as well. But like I said, I was interested in fashion and textiles. So I, uh, for my third year fashion collection, I did this three piece collection where I bought a knitting machine from Kijiji. I taught myself how to use it and I dyed all my own yarns uh, and created these three pieces. On the right here, I actually crocheted the bottom panel there uh, out of very fine uh, mm -hmm. Egyptian cotton. I learned how to crochet uh, in second year of university and I really, really love it as an art form. It's almost like 3D printing. It's very, it, you can be very freeing, but it's also very methodical and mathematical. Uh, so in my third year of university, I got to go on exchange to Philadelphia. And again, that really, really helped me look at textiles in a different way. So their pro they actually have a fibers program, not textiles. So that was very, very open. And, you know, my, my peers were working with cement and fiberglass and all these crazy materials, but they were still considered fiber students. So they had this mentality of a textile artist or a fiber artist, but we're, we're applying it to different materials and different disciplines. And they were, weren't afraid to work, you know, big and messy and really take risks. And I really, really learned a lot from this experience. Uh, one of the first projects I did when I got there, um, we had to make something to use at a dinner party. So this was called, this is called my spice wall. And it's out of uh, dyed cotton that I dyed with logwood, marigold and indigo. And I fast, I, I created these very tiny baskets that I filled with spices and herbs. So as you were serving, your meal, you would walk along the wall and uh, season your meal. Uh, to go along with the food theme, I call this my Chinese tapestry. I lived above a Chinese food place when I was in Philly. And at the same time, there was this amazing uh, exhibition at the Philadelphia Museum of Art or the Rocky Museum, if you've seen the Rocky movies. And so I, I was really inspired by the textiles I saw there. They were all in these beautiful golds and Turkish reds. And I created this piece based on one of the fabrics I saw um, out of duck sauce and hot sauce packets that I painfully stitched together. It was a very sticky and spicy process. <laughs> uh, I also created this small piece as a material study using crochet. Uh, the, the tallest one is about two inches. So they're very, very tiny. And I used cotton, uh, bamboo, linen, elastic, uh, I believe there's some nylon and silk. I just wanted to combine the materials together, see how they interacted, if it would change the shape. Um, not so much, but it, it was really fun working at this very, very minuscule scale as well. So two people who were connected uh, to Philadelphia that have been, uh, again, big supporters. On the left is Warren Selig, who has taught um, at the University of the Arts for many years in Philadelphia. And he's a world-renowned um, textile artist doesn't necessarily work with textiles as much anymore, does these massive installations, but taught me about having a textile mindset, working in assemblage, multiples, uh, different fastening devices connected to textiles, really, really expanded my mind in that way. And then on the right is Sandra Brownlee, 
who is uh, a, a hugely accomplished weaver. Uh, she taught at NASCAD for many years, and I actually worked as her assistant uh, throughout my time at NASCAD, and she's still a very good friend of mine. Uh, I'm not sure if she made it into the chat today, but she, um, she has connected me to so many people who helped me to get new experiences, new opportunities. And you really need to keep those people close. If somebody introduces you to the right person, it'll, it'll just send the ball rolling. Uh, so I'm very, very thankful for people like Sandra and Warren. So I have to go back to NASCAD to finish uh, my degree. And I spent my last year just focusing on weaving because I was interested in going into textile design because, you know, as I mentioned, when I got to NASCAD, I thought I'm interested in textile or I'm interested in fabric, so I have to do fashion. Then I discovered textile, so I meant that meant, oh, so now I can design fabrics, which I really enjoyed. I looked at it more from a technical perspective. This weaving um, is done on a 16 harness loom using linen, cotton, and then fine elements of lurex. So just very fine gold thread running throughout. I was inspired by uh, ripples in the water, specifically at night. And I, I wove some other fabrics um, using a variety of different floor looms. This, most of these pieces are done in cotton and linen, but it, just experimenting with different uh, applications for them, thinking about interior design and fashion and the functionality of fabrics. And I'm starting to really think about color a lot in my work. But in my final semester at NASCAD, I, I stumbled upon something that I was so excited about. I thought this, I, I found something new. I found something that, that's my own. And it was this process of combining knitting and weaving into one fabric. So in doing this, you can completely change the shape of a fabric or the life of a fabric. You can make it a hinge, you can make it stretch, you can make it fold, all of these different qualities, very, very time consuming and it's all done manually. But I was thinking, you know, what if there's a machine that could do this? What if it was used as seaming or if you had something on your shoulder that it helped it lay a bit differently? But again, this was, I was in my final semester and I graduated and still had all these unanswered questions. So I knew I wanted to go on to grad school. I didn't think I was quite ready yet, but I had a lot to work with um, in my time after school. And this is just another image of the of different things that this process could do. Uh, so after I graduated, uh, Sandra, who I mentioned before, put me in touch with Toshiko. And Toshiko uh, taught at NASCAD for many years as well. And she is a world-renowned uh, textile artist and engineer. Both her and her husband, Charles McAdam, have a studio in Bridgetown, Nova Scotia. And I got to live there for about a year and a half working as their studio assistant. So these installations are both art pieces, but they're also functional. Children can play on them. And they're, they're you know, a feat of engineering excellence. They're, they're absolutely amazing, very mathematical, but it, they're essentially a giant doily. Like it, you, we would get the fiber in, uh, they would get shipped in, we would dye the, the nylon fiber, then braid it into ropes and then crochet the ropes into these sculptures. So it, it was very time consuming. I got to see one piece from start to finish and uh, Toshiko taught me so much about working at such a large scale, different techniques, inspired by a lot of, you know, knots that are typically used in fishing. Uh, these balls here are, are made out of buoys that are covered in crochet. Uh, a lot of, you know, starting to be connected to, you know, my maritime thinking and my inspirations, but just in a different way. And while working for her, I actually got to go to Hong Kong to install a piece of hers at the IFC mall, which was once I think the large, the tallest building in the world before um, Dubai started sprouting up uh, obnoxiously tall buildings. But this uh, piece um, or th this experience, it was a once in a lifetime opportunity getting to travel to Asia. And once I got there, the one decision I made was that I'm going to eat everything that they put in front of me. I wasn't going to say no to anything. I'm not a very picky either, eater, so it was, it was relatively easy. But I think that is something um, artists need to really do. You need to say yes, even if you think you're not good enough for an opportunity, or if you think you're too good for an opportunity. Because every opportunity I've had, 
it's led to another. You never know who's going to be on that panel or be on that jury. You're going to get a lot of no's, but you just got to be open-minded and, and you'll get to have experiences like this. It was a lot of work. It was very hard. I was there for two weeks, um, only working at night because it wasn't uh, installed in a mall, um, but it's it was life-changing getting to go there. So while I was living in Bridgetown, I was still uh, experimenting with this idea of knitting and weaving. Again, still having a lot of questions, not being able to find the answers I was looking for. Uh, this is a piece I did out of linen. Now linen isn't the best material to knit with necessarily, especially because I had to touch it quite a bit. Linen doesn't really like to be touched that much. Um, so I created this undulating piece thinking of you know, if this could be used architecturally or in some sort of furniture form. Um, and then, but most of the results I was getting were more decorative. Uh, this is a piece done out of silk and wool that I then uh, shrunk with uh, hot water. But I, I wanted there to be a function and I wanted to figure out a machine or figure out some way to actually reproduce this in, a, in an actual functional way. So I, was, you know, urged to go on to pursue different studies. Uh, Toshiko really helped me, Sandra, my family, they all urged me to apply to grad school and I got in. I got to go to the Royal College of Art in London, England in 2016. I was accepted and I, I was I able to get a bursary through the Nova Scotia Talent Trust uh, in order to go and it was wild. I was the smallest fish in the world's biggest pond. I was the only one in my program. There was about 40 of us in textiles. I was the only North American there. I met people from all over the world, all different disciplines and backgrounds. And it, it was very overwhelming at first. It took me a while to find my footing. Uh, but one of the first projects I got when I was there that I really, really excited me was a collaboration I did with a good friend, uh, Winnie Young, who is a knitwear designer now. She was a knit student at the time. Uh, so we were all, a couple of us textile students were tasked with collaborating on to use fiber optics in a different way. So fiber optics being, if you've ever seen those kind of gimmicky Christmas trees that light up, the pine needles light up, those are fiber optics. And it, they've been used in textiles for quite a long time. They're nothing new. And they wanted to think of a non kind of gimmicky way of using them. And when they were giving this presentation to us, they blatantly said, you can't knit with them. Phew. And I don't like hearing the word can't, especially when it comes to materials. So once we heard this, uh, I looked over to my friend Winnie, who was actually kind of doing the opposite of was, uh, what I was doing at the time. She was a knitwear designer looking at incorporating woven elements into her work. I was a woven textiles designer looking at knitting. So we knew we had to team up and find a solution to this problem. So one thing about fiber optics is that in order for the light to emit uh, through the fiber, you have to actually damage it. So think of it like a cardboard tube where you're shining a light at one end and it's escaping the other. If you take a pin and prick a lot of little holes in the tube, you'll see flashes of light throughout it. So with fiber optics, you have to kind of sand it or etch it, or you can even break it and bend it kind of like a glow stick and it'll allow the light to emit throughout the tube. So what I'm doing in this uh, small video here is I'm actually sanding it with sandpaper uh, to allow the light to emit. Um, so in thinking of various ideas, various uses for this, we knew we wanted to try to knit with it. And the first thing we thought of, of course, was to make a sweater or a jumper. And so Winnie made the top half, which is all knit. And then I made the bottom half, which is all woven. And we were inspired by Guernsey or Gansey sweaters, uh, very prominent throughout the UK. And my, you know, my grandmother would make them for me growing up as well. So we wanted to have the two to show the differences between the woven structure and the knit structure um, because the way that fiber optics interacts with the two is quite different. So this is the jumper that we created uh, on the left with the lights on and then uh, in darkness. So you can see the difference between the woven section, very, very crisp 
bright square lights that I had to sand in after I wove this plaid. And then on the top, it's much more subtle and diluted. And it's interesting because it was the act of knitting itself that actually damaged the fiber. So we didn't have to treat it in any way. It was all um, through the process of running through the knitting machine that slightly damaged the fiber so that it was a very, very subtle amount of light uh, escaping. And you can see here um, in kind of a dim light. Uh, this is actually the sweater inside out to show that we worked very hard on trying to make it reversible, except for in the back, I had to figure out all this hard wiring and soldering systems. I had never worked with electronics in such a way before. It was a really interesting process. Uh, but this jumper eventually went on to be exhibited at the Victoria and Albert Museum in London, uh, in Glasgow, Scotland, and also at the Hong Kong Medical Museum in Hong Kong City. So while I was in London, uh, I was very homesick. I missed being in Canada and being around nature, being around the coast, uh, seeing the ocean. And uh, I'm also a big uh, bird nerd. I'm a big fan of birds. So I decided to uh, <coughs> a small collection of fabrics based on shorebirds from back home. Uh, this is a fabric uh, inspired by ospreys, specifically the feathers underneath Osprey's wings. <laughs> and this is done on a jacquard loom, so a computerized loom done uh, with uh, water resistant wool, regular wool, and then chenille yarn as well. And then this fabric uh, is inspired by my favorite bird, the loon. It's very, very <laughs> wide repeat. It's about a meter wide. And I was thinking of different upholstery uses for it. And this fabric, I actually used a, a wide variety of yarns that I had never really used before. Um, again, water resistant wool, uh, polypropylene, which I actually then melted to get it nice and flat uh, after weaving, lurex, so there was a slight uh, glitter effect to it, and then mohair wool as well. So I actually did two iterations of this fabric, one with the water resistant wool and one without. And they acted the exact same. It, it shows that you don't really need to rely on gimmicky materials or really, really um, specific expensive materials as long as the structure is the right structure to prevent water from peeking through. If something's completely water resistant, that means you have to sweat a lot. Um, there, there's pros and cons to using these materials, but if it, the structure isn't correct, then it's kind of pointless. So this fabric on the right here is showing the mohair on the back um, that is brushed out. And then on the front, you have the design. Mm -hmm. So I was really interested in textile structures uh, beyond just weaving. Um, off loom structures are essentially whatever's done off of a loom. So knotting, looping, braiding, twisting. There's a whole world of textiles out there that I, I find is often overlooked. Uh, this is kind of the dream project I'd love to make someday. Uh, it's all, so I digitally illustrated this piece um, and it's using four strands, so four loops that are all connected, but everything is kind of interwoven and feeding into one structure to the next to the next. And so during my time there, I was again, exploring new materials that I hadn't had access to, but still being inspired by home looking a lot at fishing materials, equipment, oil, oil slicks, or sorry, oil skins, fishing lures, buoys, um, fishing fly tying techniques. And I ended up creating these, which I call my widgets. Each is a different study of a different technique using these unconventional materials. So I used a lot of stuff from hardware stores, stuff I would find in the garbage, uh, reclaimed materials, and exploring a variety of techniques. Uh, this is one sample that I did using um, elastic uh, aquarium tubing and cotton. So the center is all knit and then the woven um, is done with the aquarium tubing. And with each of these samples, I created what I call my widget board, which has uh, one, an illustration of the structure, the minimum amount of tools that you need, and then the title of the techniques as well. So for one, another project that I had, uh, we had to create something to sit in. Specifically, one of our tutors was 
not a small man, and he had to be able to sit in the chair that we designed. So all of the textile students, um, industrial engineering students, and fashion students, we each had to design our own chair. So I took that previous sample and then blew it up in scale using bungee cords. I had to build this giant frame in order to create it as well. And I made essentially a vertical hammock. And I was thinking a lot about temporary seating. If you've, if you've ever been to like a bus stop or McDonald's where they have those chairs at a 45 degree angle, they're not super comfortable, but they'll allow you to rest for a moment. And I was thinking about that in creating this hammock. So the center is all knit. The top and bottom is all woven with PVC tubing. And then I also used steel pipes and nylon rope as well. And I installed it in the basement of uh, the Royal College. And you can see on the right there a detail of the PVC tubing. So I really liked working at this scale and I liked working in the installation pieces. Uh, this is another chair that we had to do using just one tool. So I used my crochet hook and I crocheted about 100 meters of extension cable, believe it or not, uh, to make this all tucked inside. And it still works, even if you, uh, you loop it and knot it in such a way. So I plugged in an Ikea lamp and installed it in a hallway to prove that it was still functional. So I was interested in doing these big installation pieces, but I couldn't really afford all the giant ropes and big materials I wanted to use. Um, again, London's a very, very expensive city to live in. Um, but, you know, my friends were saying, you can just buy a machine and build it yourself. I'm like, well, that's even more expensive. And who has the time? So I, I thought about making my own machine uh, to do it for me. And I created this rope twister. It's an eight strand rope twister made out of a laser cut MDF, uh, steel fixings. And it's shown here with my funfetti rope, which is linen um, embedded with cut up a rubber bands. Uh, and I really, really loved making my own equipment. It, it really gave me a new outlook on how things were made, um, the purposes of, for each material. And it was really fun doing everything from scratch. I created a variety of devices. On the right, I actually made with my dad over Christmas break when I got to come home. It's a three strand rope winder. And on the left are two uh, Kumihimo discs, which are Japanese braiding discs. You use the slots to kind of dictate the patterns that you're making. I, I have a clip later on that will show that process. And then on the bottom is actually a knitting hook that I created in the, in the metal studio with a steel rod and sheet metal. So I thought about what materials I wanted to use to then make more materials. So I wanted to make ropes out of a variety of materials, mostly wool and thinking about uh, the, a lot of plastic, you know, there's a lot of plastic on fishing vessels, the giant kind of blue plastic bins that lobsters are stored in. I looked at plumbing fixtures, uh, plastic dipping, uh, a variety of different techniques. And I started creating a range of ropes. And originally I was going to then use these ropes to make installation pieces, but I found the process so enjoyable and also time consuming that I ended up just, just sticking with making the material. So this is uh, showing the process of braiding through the Kumihimo disc, it feeds through the center. And I did this with shock cord and plumbing fixtures so you could kind of plug the rope in to make different shapes. This is another braid I created using shock cord and my giant Kumihimo disc. So bungee cord or shock cord is really hard to work with. It bounces, it has kind of a mind of its own. So I kind of created these specific shapes within the disc to sort of lock the material in as I was working. Mm. And this is about the size of a, a large pizza mm. in terms of scale. Uh, this is a, a study of a Turk's head knot, which you often see on masts. It's done in felted wool and nylon. And I made this kind of clunky uh, netting shuttle as well. Uh, for the piece. This is, a, I call my hawser. It's based on those massive cables that you see on docks uh, for ships and anchors. And they're you know, typically made out of hemp or cotton. And this one I did out of wool roving. It's about a meter long and I wanna say about four or five inches thick. And then I 
uh, wrapped a few sections of it in gold dyed nylon rope. And this piece I call my big boy, or they say boy uh, in the UK instead of buoy, which I love because it meant I could have make so many puns about it. And I, so this piece was inspired by boat fenders or buoys. And I used upholstery bolsters, which are, you know, to, uh, to foam tubes that are used in armchairs and the arms of couches. And I dyed them and then I braided them into the structure. And then after braiding it, I, I coiled sections of it. So you could see the interior of the braid as well. It's about a meter in length and 20 inches uh, in diameter, give or take. And it was really fun, again, working at such a big scale. So for my uh, graduation exhibition, uh, we were all kind of put in this giant room and uh, had a very small space to work with, but I knew I wanted to install my tools for the public to use. So I installed my rope winder, I set it up and I didn't let, I didn't explain anything to anybody. I just said, give it a go, try to make rope. And you would be surprised at how intuitive humans are. All you need to do to make rope is twist in one direction and then twist in the other. It's, it's very, very simple. Once that you have it in your hands, you're naturally inclined to do it. So I, I got to speak to you know, molecular scientists who were like, this looks like a DNA helix. I, I spoke to engineers who uh, made twisted steel cables for uh, bridges. And, but, but the one person who inspired me the most through that week was this little boy here. Uh, I, so I set up this machine. I had it ready to go and I realized I forgot my scissors. So I had to run upstairs uh, to the eighth floor to get my scissors. And by the time I came back down, this little boy had made about three or four strands of rope. I had never spoken to this boy. I didn't know who he was, where he came from. He, I didn't see him watching me either. So I had no idea how he figured out how to do this. And I was so excited. I ran over, I wanted to ask how he did it. And he thought he was in trouble and then ran away. So I couldn't oh. figure out what happened or if he had been watching. Uh, but I, I was just so, this, I was like, this is what I wanted. This is the, exactly the reason why I set it up. So at the end of the day, I found him sitting on uh, this pillar with all of his ropes. And I found out he was the son of one of the product design professors and he didn't speak any English. So even if I had wanted to speak to him, I probably wouldn't have been able to interview him. But it was at this moment I realized I love that epiphany moment in people when people when things just click when it can be something as obvious as twisting a rope or tying a knot I really really love that and I, I knew I wanted to teach I always knew I wanted to teach but it was that really confirmed it for me so I actually got the opportunity to come back and teach at NASCAD so I graduated in 2018 and came back to Nova Scotia and realized I really, really missed home. So I made this piece immediately. I call my lobster net and it's all crocheted. It's based on the lobster emoji. And there's a pair of claw crackers on the bottom there for, uh, to show scale. Okay. So I actually got to start teaching um, off loom structures at NASCAD, which is actually the class that Toshiko created and taught for many years. And I got to take over and sort of make it my own. And I was so lucky that I had probably the best group of students to have for a first time teacher. They were also open minded and willing to learn and just excited about these processes. And I had had so many, you know, life changing instructors that I was like, I want to be that person for somebody else. So taking the time to realize everybody learns differently. Some people are visual learners. Some people need to watch me physically do something. And some people will just read a text and be able to replicate something just like that. So it, it was really, really, and that kind of informed my own practice as well. Um, I like when people can see how something is made, even if it's a textile structure, if it's, um, you know, any anything, I think it's, it's really, uh, really interesting in terms of craft to know how something is made. I've also been teaching workshops outside of NASCAD. Um, I got to teach a really fun mending workshop uh, in La Have at Leslie Armstrong's weaving studio or the La Have weaving studio. And so it was this amazing group of people with um, all of their old clothing or anything they wanted to fix. And I think in order to fix something, you should know how something is made. So, um, and I think textiles is a really great example of that. Understanding how knit, 
how to knit, then you can uh, fix your knitting uh, using different darning techniques. And it was re a really, really fun workshop uh, with this group. And these are uh, my teaching tools. There are all the socks that my grandmother has made me over the years, except on the top left, my mom made me that pair and it took her about four years to make. Um, <laughs> I'm calling you out, mom. <laughs> but, yeah, but I really, really weird. love them because yep. they actually look woven. So it's, it's a nice yeah. example of combining weaving and knitting uh, into a textile. So uh, I, I love teaching mending workshops because I think it really, really helps you connect to your clothing in a different way. So I don't know if these clips will work or not, but I have some little videos of mending. No, I don't think they will. Not important. But I got to do another workshop up in Sackville, New Brunswick uh, at a conference called The Handmade Assembly, where they invite uh, craft artists uh, from across Canada to teach workshops and hold conferences, or sorry, hold um, talks. And so I taught both rope making and braiding. Uh, I brought up all of my equipment there. It was such a blast. I had people from 12 years old up to 80 years old in the group. Um, and so we were doing braiding like this. Uh, this mm -hmm. is kumihimo braiding, which is very, very repetitious and very methodical. Um, almost therapeutic once you get the hang of it. Mm -hmm. And then I also got to teach another rope workshop uh, with a group of Cub Scouts. <laughs> and it was a hoot. It was the funnest day that I've probably had teaching. And as I mentioned before, I, 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 had, I was in 4-H, but I re I'd really wanted to join Scouts when I was a kid, I think. And, you know, girls joining Scouts at the time, it wasn't, you know, such, such a huge thing. But with this group, there were three young girls uh, in the group, which I really, really thought was important and it made things much more enjoyable. And it also showed every single kid here learned how to make rope. No, there were no failures. Everybody got it eventually. And it goes to show, again, it doesn't matter your age, your skill set, you can make things. Uh, it's just here as humans, we naturally want to twist and form materials. So I had, spent, I had spent like two years teaching and I hadn't really focused on my own work that much, um, you know, wanting to make ends meet and establish, you know, some sort of a career. But I was able to do my first artist residency through the Center for Craft in Halifax, uh, literally the week of the first lockdown. So I got into the building and then the doors were locked. Nobody else was allowed in. Uh, which was a bit of a problem because my whole pitch was that I was going to set up all my equipment and allow everybody to come in like madmen and just create and learn. So because I couldn't do that, I rented a GoPro. I figured out all these different filming techniques to try and share my process through social media um, and just using whatever I had. So I, I flipped chairs upside down. I created looms out of tables. Uh, I was using anything I could get from Canadian Tire because it was still an essential service or an essential business. And it, it was a huge amount of fun uh, doing that. Um, again, I don't know if this clip will go, but I, I was looking a lot of different techniques uh, along with rope making, but really thinking about fly fishing techniques and the materials there. Uh, this, I, I call my Dr. Seuss rope and it's using um, fly fishing tinsel as a decorative effect and again very very time consuming but just trying to get different textures and different shapes i'm running can i just interrupt i'm enjoying yeah. this so much but i've just i'm down to like i'm losing my juice <laughs> on my <laughs> it's gonna go black in my but one minute i'll stick okay. with it until it does but it's not because i left you this oh, no good. worries. No worries it's, at all. And I, I think it'll be recorded as well. You must pinch yourself. You've just had this amazing journey, just putting one foot in front of the other. <laughs> and uh, obviously your enthusiasm and your tenacity is what makes everything work for you. I, I admire you very much. I'm so glad you're going to be here with us. And I'm looking forward to more. But you carry on. And if my screen <laughs> goes back, that's going to have to be it. Yeah. Oh, thank you so much. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so at, the, at this residency, again, I was looking at, at filming different things, just 
doing as much as I could within the time that I had and probably going a little bit stir crazy because I was by myself, but I had this massive space. So I got to really do whatever I wanted. And this video just shows the process of setting up uh, to twist my rope on my, on my self-made machine. The one thing about making rope is that you kind of need a team to make really long lengths. And I don't have a team. I just have myself, especially during COVID. So I was happy to have equipment that allowed me to make my rope, my rope by myself. So you can see that uh, the device kind of twists on its own and shrinks as you're twisting. I got to do my second residency um, also during COVID, uh, but it was in July. So things were starting to open up, but it, it was still fairly restrictive. And it, it was in my hometown of New Glasgow through the New Glasgow Library and through Visual Arts Nova Scotia. And this, it was a blast here too. I got to do another uh, set of workshops, both on twisting and braiding. And again, ha having kids being involved, I think it makes it much more enjoyable for the adults because they can see how easy it is and it's a little, best, a little less overwhelming. And again, I just had all this free time to explore, not getting super distracted by a lot of visitors, which I guess was good in the long run, but at the time, you know, it was a bit disappointing. But again, I tried to experiment with different documentation techniques and having a lot of fun on my own. And while I was there, you know, because I was staying with my parents who are uh, near, are in Marigamish, uh, near uh, Big Island Beach, I spent a lot of time collecting lobster bands while I was up there. And so these are all lobster bands I collected from Big Island Beach. And there, there were about 500 on the first walk that we did uh, with my mom, and then about another 500 on the second walk that we did. So on the image on the left, you can see there were about 60 lobster bands. Uh, just in that one image. Uh, so it, it was ridiculous, the amount. And you can see that they're all fairly new. They're not used bands, but we were finding them washed up on shore. And I was collecting them, didn't really know what I wanted to do with them. But I, I knew, especially during COVID, I think it was really interesting to use the materials you had access to. So I started experimenting with different techniques, a lot of bead weaving techniques, both on the loom and off the loom and incorporating knotting. So I decided I wanted to make a quilt using these techniques. And so this is uh, what I had designed. And you have to thread band by band, piece by piece. And I ended up creating this piece uh, for Nocturne last October. And it was my first um, time exhibiting in such a festival. It was my first time exhibiting work that was so big um, in this way in the elements. And it was so stressful. I didn't sleep a wink after I installed it because I was worried it was just going to fall down. It was super windy and rainy that week that I installed it. But I had researched all these different slicing and knotting methods. I, I worked a lot with the Museum of the Atlantic. Uh, they taught me different knots that I could use. And so this piece, I called it 100 years because it takes about 100 years for these bands to break down into microplastics. And it goes to show that, that they were made to be resilient and they were made to survive and be adaptable. And I think that that's a quality that I want to run throughout my work. That's just a detailed shot about the, uh, showing the sheer amount of bands. Yeah. That we use. Um, also um, in the spirit of, you know, recycling and reusing, I was uh, making a lot of nets out of uh, Sobeys bags that I twisted into twine. And I really loved working with nets. So for my time here in Chester, I know I wanted to work with mending and nets and this structure that I didn't really have a lot of experience uh, with. Um, I had a little bit of experience I, with the Sobeys bag nets, but not a ton. So I got to set up studio uh, at Annika's studio here in Chester. And this is my little assistant founder. And I just started playing around with, with nets and incorporating different structures within the nets. So I like this idea of, of kind of mindlessly mending them. So they're not no longer functional necessarily, but just having the time to, to think about what, what my hands are doing, um, thinking about a lot of busy work. I think especially during working from home periods, we do a lot of busy work just to make the day go. And just thinking, thinking about that idea as I'm mending. So using woven structures, loop structures, um, mending it you know the proper way 
and then patching them together. Uh, this is a small quilt study. I'd like to make a, a bigger piece uh, similar to this process. I also brought a lot of my family's um, objects to <laughs> mend uh, while I'm here. This is my dad's carving apron that I've mended and I patched with some iron on patches and then stitching. Uh, this is a quilt I've been working on, my great grandmother's quilt that I've been slowly mending and a teddy bear that my great grandmother made me that I've mended. And then I'm also working on another lobster band quilt while I'm here, just because I, I figured I'd have access to a lot more bands. So I will say Chester has the cleanest beaches I've ever seen. I went to one beach and I found one band. So I think it'll be, it'll be a process still collecting more. Uh, but this is what I have so far for that second quilt. Wow. And that's all I have to show.